introduce yourself. Uh, I'm Iris uh, Christou, um, University of Maryland in the United States, College Park, uh, uh, Maryland in the United States. So I'm very happy to be uh, present and to participate in this uh, uh, conference. Uh, my specific area of expertise is uh, nanoelectronics. I've been fortunate to uh, uh, see my field progress from microelectronics to now nanoelectronics and just about everything that we do is uh, at the uh, nanoscale uh, level. And um, uh, my area in microelectronics or nanoelectronics and uh, ultra uh, large scale integrated uh, circuits, uh, uh, originally based on silicon, has now progressed uh, to the nanoscale level. And present technology has allowed us to integrate uh, over 40 billion transistors on one uh, chip, and that has to be done with nanoelectronic uh, processing uh, uh, technology, and that's where the great advantage uh, has been achieved by the utilization and the application of nanostructured uh, materials. Is it uh, to do with the lithography and, and super expensive masks? that they design and somehow are so accurate and precise and they get to such low sizes? Yes, there, there are two ways of uh, achieving uh, nanoscale sizes or achieving uh, uh, design rules right now uh, on chips which are have been reduced down to uh, three nanometers to five, three to five nanometers. One way is through uh, what I call brute force uh, with uh, a, a very advanced lithographic uh, techniques, uh, either based on uh, electron beam lithography or uh, X-ray beam, uh, uh, X-ray uh, lithography. Another way is, of course, uh, the bottom up. As uh, Professor Feynman, who won the uh, Nobel Prize in Physics, uh, uh, said uh, uh, in the 90s, in the early 90s, he predicted the field of uh, nano uh, scale nanostructure materials and nanotechnology that uh, he predicted that we would have an entire new world by building uh, new structures bottom up, atom by atom. So you could achieve this large scale integrated circuit through self-assembly of uh, uh, materials, essentially putting materials together atom by atom, layer by layer. Uh, so there are two ways that you could achieve uh, this uh, very large uh, and massively integrated uh, chip, uh, which has on it over 40 billion transistors. So these uh, chips are mind-blowingly amazing, and they're, they've changed the world, and they're gonna change the world even more. But can you see a lot of nanoelectronics elsewhere? Yes, uh, my, my main interest is in the application of nanoelectronics elsewhere. And this comes into the uh, development and application of new types of semiconductor materials. And these are called uh, uh, wide band gap semiconductor materials and ultra wide band gap semiconductor materials. Uh, an example of this would be uh, gallium nitride, all of the nitride based semiconductor, um, uh, compound semiconductor materials will give us uh, new functionalities uh, in the area of power electronics, for instance, to be able to, uh, uh, in a very smart way, control and switch the uh, power grid. Uh, uh, another application would be uh, very sensitive uh, uh, magnetic resonance imaging equipment for health uh, for uh, health purposes, MRIs, uh, you may be able now to switch within uh, high magnetic fields uh, from 7 Tesla to 11 Tesla and get uh, ultra high preci uh, precision of uh, uh, malignant uh, tumors in the brain, for instance. Uh, so the next generation of MRI equipment will have a nanostructured uh, wide band gap and ultra wide band gap semiconductor materials and circuits based on those types of materials. Is it still the output still going to look like chips, or uh, where? Do, how does it going to look like? Is it possible to spread it around the whole MRI machine, or? Uh, no, it will be chip. It will be the controlled uh, circuitry. Uh, in the work that I'm doing, it will be the. Control 
controlled circuitry, which will be, you'll be able to control and switch the magnetic fields right within the core of the magnetic field and not worry about magnetic field uh, uh, electron interactions or magnetic field and semiconductor material interactions. Uh, so this, the, the, this will allow you to bring uh, all of the control circuitry very close to, to the patient and not have it uh, in a uh, separate room. If you've ever had an MRI uh, taken, you know, the electronics, uh, you go into this big, uh, 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 the core of a big magnet, superconducting yeah. magnet, and everything else is in a separate room, and you hear massive noise as the uh, magnetic fields are being scanned from 7 Tesla to 11 Tesla. Well, we will be able to do this very rapidly, very efficiently, uh, right, uh, very near to the patient. Is it going to lower the cost of the MRI machine? Uh, well, the MRI machine, uh, the cost is still driven by the very expensive superconducting magnets, uh, very high field superconducting magnets. Uh, so I don't uh, foresee any cost reduction. How about the gallium natrite? Uh, uh, it's been talked about for a long time, or is it, it sounds like it's one of those materials that's really awesome to work with. Uh, yeah, it, uh, yeah, we have known about it for a very long time, but one of the problems that has prevented its uh, utilization, and I uh, will be talking about this uh, in this uh, conference, is the uh, are the defects that are present in this material. So how can we lower the defect density uh, uh, in this material? How can we grow the material so that it has ultra low defect density? And this will allow a gallium, arson, a gallium nitride circuits uh, to be achieved in a very reliable uh, manner. We don't want them to fail every few hours. We want them to uh, have a mean time to failure or a lifetime of the order of five years, three to five years uh, at least. So uh, in my little uh, high uh, watt charger and little power banks and stuff, they always advertise this GAN that's the new thing to get more power in there and stuff like that. But it's been a challenge to be, to have a good yield, to have a no defect. Yes. And how, what is the trick? Well, the, the uh, the uh, trick is going back to how the material is grown atom by atom uh, and the uh, growth techniques, uh, which are very uh, elaborate. The two uh, have to grow uh, layer by layer, which is epitaxially matched uh, to a substrate. Uh, one of the big problems with gallium nitride is uh, to grow the thin film layers, epitaxial layers on which the transistor uh, transitions and integrated circuits are made uh, uh, requires uh, uh, lattice matching to a substrate and there is not that we do not have a low-cost substrate on which to grow the epitaxial films and, and that problem is uh, uh, ha is being solved and the, and as the market size goes up then the cost will also go down so that means this is going to come and Kind of like revolutionize a whole bunch of areas in electronics. Uh, yes, we've seen, uh, for instance, we've seen gallium nitride in light emitting diodes and laser diodes. Uh, this gives us the blue, uh, uh, the blue color. So, the blue uh, laser diode. Uh, well, uh, a laser diode made from gallium nitride multi layers emits in the blue region. Now we have uh, uh, green and red, so being able to mix blue, green, uh, and um, uh, blue, green, and red, you've been able to get white light. Uh, uh, for instance, you've been able, we've been able to cover the entire spectrum. So, gallium nitride in a uh, emitting laser in a laser diode has been very important in uh, multicolored displays, for instance. So what happens after gallium nitride? What's the next kind of things? Are, are you looking at some other things? Well, as we go, yes. Uh, that, that's, thank you for asking that question. As you go toward wider and wider band gap, the, the optimum material that we hope to achieve as a semiconductor, for semiconductor electronics will be diamond. And diamond is also semiconducting. 
Okay, that has uh, a band gap of the order of five electron volts versus three electron volts uh, with gallium nitride. So we hope to be able to achieve even better high temperature, uh, high uh, magnetic field, and high voltage performance with diamond electronics as well. So I'm going to have diamonds in my chargers and power banks. Uh, and, and, but how do you form it in the shape you need well, and everything? Well, and, I'm guessing you're not going to use natural diamonds. No, no. You have to use synthetic uh, diamonds, of, of course. So you have to uh, produce diamond thin films uh, utilizing high temperature and high pressure uh, techniques. And that's where the big challenge is and where the big cost lies. So uh, you ha uh, you're, uh, you're required to go close to 2,000 degrees. Uh, centigrade and uh, hundreds of uh, uh, millibars of pressure in order to go into the diamond phase. Otherwise, you'll end up with graphite or coal, uh, which you don't, you really don't want. There's a lot. Of, there's already uh, cobalt and gold and all these electronics. Uh, uh, they're precious now. It'll yeah. be diamonds. Well, diamond. The only thing that you need to make diamond is carbon. Uh, so. Carbon, around, uh, carbon, and then high temperature, high pressure. Uh, and the the Tolio plans how to realize this with all the pressure you're talking about and everything. Yeah, we, we've known how to do this uh, for uh, an entire century, but to be able to do this uh, for, uh, to produce large enough wafers for microelectronics processing has been the challenge. How far in the future is all this? Oh, is it possible to get all this like next year? You know. Well, you could buy a diamond uh, uh, transistor right now. Uh, there are companies I know in the U.S. and Japan that uh, will sell discrete transistors. They're excellent sensors, uh, high temperature sensors. But for larger circuits, it will take about I would say another decade of uh, uh, research. And what kind of electronics uh, do you think are most fascinating otherwise to talk about? Uh, the, the kind of electronics uh, right now that uh, uh, are the ones that will combine uh, biological functions with inorganic functions, to combine uh, organic and inorganic materials. So, uh, and this will give us an entire uh, uh, an entire uh, new capability and really the possibility of exceeding the limits of Moore's law. Moore's law tells us that uh, uh, the number of uh, transistors uh, in, um, uh, that you could put on a chip essentially doubles every three years. Well, our feature size now is becoming so small that uh, uh, in order to produce a signal from the transistor, we're just moving a few electrons around. Okay. So we're running up against the limit, uh, 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 which is uh, imposed, which is called uh, Moore's Law, uh, uh, the limitations of Moore's Law. To go beyond that, then uh, an entire new paradigm of uh, electronics has to be created. And this is where uh, the capabilities of biology uh, uh, will play an important role. Uh, Something like OLEDs? Well, OLEDs uh, are presently available, but even beyond that, for instance, uh, think of uh, being able to process uh, Avogadro's number of bits of information per picosecond. Uh, Avogadro's number is 10 to the 24th. Okay, that's a gigantic number. Okay, perhaps that's the real limits. That's the real limit that uh, we will eventually face as a uh, as a science. So you base all that on your experience. Do you mind telling a little bit what you've done in, in your career? Uh, yes, I've uh, been a research scientist uh, for uh, a one of the government laboratories in the United States for uh, uh, 20 years, the Naval Research Laboratory. After that, I became a professor at Rutgers University in uh, the area of microelectronics. And then from Rutger, Rutgers University, I went to chair the uh, material science and engineering department at the University of Maryland uh, for about uh, uh, 12 years. And now I'm a, a research scientist, uh, and I head the uh, wide band uh, 
Gap Semiconductor Laboratory at the University of Maryland, uh, in addition to being a professor at, uh, in the material science department. So some of your research, some of your work, some of your students have uh, affected everything in the world? I, I hope so. I have, uh, I have uh, a number of my students um, uh, are working in key companies such as Northrop Grumman and Intel, um, and um, I, I've placed a number of students at those companies that are leading um, uh, industrial research endeavors. So, uh, I have students who became uh, professors at uh, major universities in the uh, United States, and I, ha I also have students who are uh, members of the uh, faculty here in Greece uh, at the University of Crete. Uh, uh, I have two faculty members who are uh, previous students of mine uh, who are doing very well. And you enjoy coming here to the Technology Conference? I, I enjoy coming here. I've come, well, of course, the last time I came in person was in 2019. I, I've come off and on since 2010. I, I'm originally from Thessaloniki. I was born here, and I'm always happy to uh, uh, return and see my uh, all of the roots of, from where I came from. Okay, thanks. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Thank you very much.